I'm sure that today's case would be interesting to both seniors and juniors alike. Just to get you oriented, this is a catheter angiogram where the catheter is introduced via the femoral artery, going to the iliac artery, reaching the aorta, and then selectively introduced into the right renal artery. Now with the catheter being in the right renal artery, we'll inject contrast. Let's look at this again. Initially, as we inject, you see normal branching renal arterial divisions. But if we proceed more, you notice that some of the renal arteries have these beaded nodular areas, which we could call at this phase tiny aneurysms or pseudo aneurysms, such as this one here. As we proceed, you have enhancement of the renal parenchyma itself. However, this enhancement is totally abnormal. Normally enhancing renal parenchyma should be homogeneous without areas of filling defects, such as these white areas. Such an appearance tells you that there are mass lesions that are displacing the renal parenchyma. Another important finding is that some of these vessels are extending beyond the confinement of the kidney, such as the vessels here. And this vascular extension here, although this is subtle compared to this, they're both abnormal. You'll notice that the vessels in this region as well are tortuous, elongated, and disorganized. Normal vessels should be confined to the kidney and should decrease in caliber in a smooth way as they go from proximal to peripheral, which is not the case here. Again, this highly vascularized region shows tiny dots representing pseudoaneurysms. This abnormal appearance of vessels radiating outwards in a focal area is known as a sunburst appearance. Now that we saw the right kidney, let's look at the left kidney with the catheter reaching the left renal artery. And let's start injecting contrast. Now you could easily tell that the left kidney has a similar involvement as the right kidney, and describing these abnormalities is much easier. So let's do this together. The arteries appear extremely tortuous and disorganized in some areas. Some are focal in a sunburst appearance with multiple internal pseudoaneurysms extending beyond the confinement of the kidney. With a very heterogeneous uh, nephrographic phase uh, showing focal areas of deficient enhancement denoting multiple uh, internal lesions as well. Based on this, you're suspecting multiple bilateral renal tumors, some of which are highly vascular. Now let's look at the CT of this patient. Before we proceed, I'll tell you that she's a 24-year-old female patient who presented with abdominal pain. For students, you're looking at the patient from her feet. This is anterior, this is posterior, this is right, and this is left. And we'll start with the left kidney. So this is the left kidney showing multiple well-defined hypodense lesions. You see those here. If you take any single one of those lesions, you'll notice that the color of the lesion, the density, is similar to that of fat, such as the subcutaneous fat here. For seniors, you could tell that this is fat just by looking at it. You could confirm it by measuring the household units, and the numbers would be in the minus. 
One important point for seniors is that these fat-containing lesions may extend outside the kidney, and the fat of the lesion might blend with the fat surrounding the kidney, so the lesion fat with the perinephric fat, and that might underestimate the size of the abnormality. That's why some authors call this the tip of the iceberg lesion, since you have a small tip that you could see here, but the remainder of the iceberg is actually outside. And remember the lesion that we saw in the lower pole in the catheter angiogram extending outside the confinements of the kidney? This is it here. So this is a good example of a tip of an iceberg. These renal lesions also have soft tissue components. The soft tissue components likely represent smooth muscle, and that's why these lesions are known as angiomyolipomas. We know they contain vessels, that's the angiopart, they contain muscles, that's the myopart, and they contain fat, that's the lipoma part. Angiomyolipomas, or AMLs, are basically hamartomas. A hamartoma is exaggeration of normal tissue in normal location. So an AML is a benign hamartoma of the kidney containing muscle, fat, and vessels. They are relatively common, and they are considered the most common benign tumor of the kidney. And they are most commonly detected as an incidental finding on asymptomatic patients. However, because they contain vessels, they have a predilection to bleed, and that's why some patients might present with abdominal pain. Now that we know that fact, let's look at the right kidney on this uh, CT without intravenous contrast. You notice that you have similar lesions. So predominantly fat-containing lesions in the right kidney consistent with angiomyolipomas, but you also have this area of abnormality here. And as you know from before, hyperdensity on a CT scan without contrast is a sign of hemorrhage. So this spontaneously large heterogeneous and bright area represents bleeding within this big fat containing lesion. The larger the angiomyolipoma, the higher the risk of bleeding. Classically, an angiomyolipoma more than 4 cm is of high risk. Now, another risk factor for uh, bleeds is an angiomyelopoma that contains uh, small pseudoaneurysms that exceed a size of 5 millimeters. Angiomyelopoma is commonly sporadic, but if you have multiple bilateral AMLs, you should think about a specific entity. And the entity that you should think about is known as tuberous sclerosis, which is a neurocutaneous uh, hamartomatous syndrome. So TS is associated with hamartomas in multiple uh, sites of the body, including the brain, bone, heart, lungs, and kidneys. The way TS could manifest in the kidney is in the form of multiple AMLs. For MCQ sake, if you have a TS patient, there is an 80% chance of having AML in the kidney. And if you have an AML in the kidney, there is a 20% chance of having tuberous sclerosis. Now going back to the uh, catheter angiogram, a reason to perform catheter angiogram in these cases is to embolize uh, an AML. Microembolization is the treatment of choice for an AML that bled or an AML that has a risk of bleeding. And here's the left kidney with that large AML that's highly vascular in the lower pole. And this is the same kidney after microembolization by particles, showing you absence of enhancement in the lower pole. So the renal branches that supply the abnormality were selectively targeted and blocked using small particles to prevent further bleeds. Now let's review what we talked about today we saw an interesting case of an abnormal renal angiogram. Focal net enhancement within the renal parenchyma may denote the presence of masses. Abnormal vessels may appear as vessels extending beyond the confinement of the kidney. Vessels that are elongated, tortuous, disorganized, and containing small outpouching pseudoaneurysms. 
and an AML might give you a classic sign known as a sunburst appearance. AML of the kidneys are very common. They're benign hamartomas containing fat, vessels, and smooth muscle. A single AML conveys a risk of uh, tuberous sclerosis in 20%. A tuberous sclerosis patient might have AML in 80% of the cases. AML is a usually asymptomatic incidental finding, but if it's larger than 4 centimeters or has a pseudoaneurysm that's larger than 5 millimeters, it may bleed. Microembolization is the treatment of choice for AML that's either at high risk of bleeding or that has bled. That's it for today's case. In the future, I'll show you more features of tuberous sclerosis on this patient. Thanks for watching. I'll wait for your comments and see you later. Welcome again, everybody. This is a quick classic show and tell case. The first thing you'll notice is that the cardiac shadow is not in its normal location. Instead of having an apex on the left, the apex seems to be directed to the right side. Before jumping to conclusions, make sure that the technician labeled the x-ray in a correct fashion, where right is right and left is left, and that's the case here. So after double checking with the technician that the position is correct, now you have a right-sided cardiac apex and that's termed dextrocardia. In medicine, by the way, dextro means right and levo means left. Normally the apex should be on the left and that's what we term levocardia. If it's on the right, such as this case here, it's called dextrocardia. Another finding that you notice here is that the uh, aortic arch is not present on the left, instead you see the aortic arch bump on the right side. And this right aortic arch could be also confirmed by its impression on the tracheal air column here. See how the dark air is seen here and then you have a small impression here. An additional neat finding is the presence of this air lucency with a fluid level on the right. This is the gastric air bubble. This should be on the left. Now, an additional important finding is something that seniors might have noticed, such as what we see here. Looking carefully, you'll see that you have extra shadows here. You have extra lines and tubular structures, which you don't see in the upper lungs. The upper lung looks relatively cleaner and darker and only has these normal vascular shadows. The same is true on the right side, although more subtle. You have additional lines that you should not see, Compare that to the darker lung above here. The tubular structures and the rounded structures actually represent dilated airways. This is known as bronchiectasis. If you look carefully on the lateral x-ray as well, you notice you have these rounded and sometimes these tubular structures, consistent with uh, what we call bronchiectasis. Such tubular appearance is known as tram track appearance, which is a sign of bronchiectasis on chest radiographs. Now let's put everything together. You have a right aortic arch, dextrocardia, a right gastric air bubble, consistent with what's known as situs inversus. Situs inversus means that the position of structures within the body are at the opposite to what's expected normally. Hence the name inversus or reversed. Now the presence of situs inversus with bronchiectasis leads to a classic diagnosis known as Cartagener syndrome. By the way, many people uh, pronounce this Cartagener syndrome, but the correct pronunciation of the name of the physician describing it is Cartagener. This is an autosomal recessive disease that results in abnormal motion of the cilia. That's why this disease is under the entity known as primary ciliary dyskinesia, which uh, is thought to be the main reason for all the abnormalities. Since the cilia is not moving well, you don't have clearance from the airways and that results in uh, impaction of mucus and secretions and bronchiectasis. And since uh, the clearance is uh, affected by gravity, the effect on the lower lungs is more pronounced. That's why you see bronchiectasis in the lower lungs. Due to the inability to properly uh, clear secretions, those patients uh, would also have uh, chronic paranasal sinusitis. Male patients, another entity would be uh, infertility due to abnormal sperm motion. The triad for Cartagainers is uh, situs inversus, bronchiectasis, and paranasal sinusitis. 
To summarize what we talked about today, if you see a case of dextrocardia, make sure that the x-ray is labeled correctly, right is right and left is left. Once you do that, you could check the position of the aortic arch and the gastric air bubble to confirm what you're looking at. And since the classic entity of cardiganers is characterized by uh, situs inversus, bronchiectasis, and chronic sinusitis, look for tran track appearance. And that's it for this interesting case of dextrocardia. Thanks for watching. I'll leave you here knowing that your heart's in the right place. See you later.